First Spin. Welcome to First Spin, a show where I learn how to use the parallax propeller without having any prior programming experience. And rather than do this on my own, I have enlisted the help of two experts. Hi, guys. Hey. What's up? Um, Not much. Yeah, just making videos. Man, we can't even talk about the Maker Fair because... None of us went. No, we're we're yeah. Well, it's all the way over in New York, East Coasters. I know. Yeah. I know. We could rehash things from the San Francisco Maker Fair, but how many months no. ago was that anyway? It was like what May. Mm. So poo. Next convention thingy I'm going to is Parallax um, Expo. Yeah, yeah, in April. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. I well, I don't know. I don't know if it's in April, guys. Don't quote me on this. I'm just There's guessing. No date yet. I'm guessing. There is no, no date, date yet. No date has been set. OBC, Jeff, if you're listening, set a date. We'll save it. <laughs> Send out the save the date cards. It sort of has a little bit to do with Ken and Parallax also. Yeah, now that it's official. I guess it's well, the it's unofficial at, official. It's also at Parallax, True. so even when it's unofficial, he still has to plan it. True. So you're saying we can't like throw a party in Ken's office whenever we feel like it? <laughs> We no, should. I'm sure that would be limited access. But. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today we continue on the epic quest to answer questions from the forums. Uh, first spin ideas is the forum topic in the Parallax forum. So if you have not checked it out, feel free to check it out. Add, please, because, um, yeah, that, yeah. We're getting our yeah. ideas from there. I should also mention that I have, I think, recently put up a blog post about the Sound Pal, um, and a video will be forthcoming. I know a lot of folks ended up getting those in their uh, 25, 20, Parallax 25th anniversary mystery bags. Yeah, I got one of those. Yeah. So, And I don't know how many people have used them. But they're actually really simple to set up. But the existing like material for them was all in uh, for basic stamp. Correct. So, so Eddie since I'm a pop fan, put together prop stuff. Right. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I figured out how to make it do notes. So which you know, is a big Roy deal. and I can take credit <laughs> for that because you know we showed her how. Yeah. No, you didn't. Not, not, not specifically that not thing, but power. how to be able to do the I, thing. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That mm -hmm. is true. We taught you enough that you could go off and make something on your own. That's so true. Uh, we'll be expecting our paychecks, everyone. Right. Just, uh, <laughs> make that uh, payable to Whisker and Roy. Two cents <laughs> and Tummy Lind. Yeah, uh, I get paid uh, high fives, man. High fives. That's too high much. fives and cookies. No, no, no. Goulash? Maybe. Cookies. Sounds good. like a. All right, we're. I mean, we uh, we clearly need to eat dinner, but. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Just for those who want a basic understanding, first, SoundPal, super easy. It's this little piezo buzzer that's stuck on this tiny, cute little board, and it looks like a little tiny T uh, with two sides being headers that you can plug into a servo header, and it can pretty much do notes. It has these little set sequences that you can access, like the tap, like Taps or Dixie or Cucaracha, you know just in case you want to liven up your party a little bit more. <laughs> um, and it, I think like with four lines of code and uh, an object that was written by Phil Pil Pilgrim in uh, 2007, I believe, that I found yep. on the forums, you know, super easy to, to get that set up and um, test around a few things. You can change tempo. You can change uh, how long the notes go for. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty cool little little gadget. And um, I don't know. Would you be able to make it talk? Not necessarily. Right? It, would, it would probably sound pretty, pretty, pretty yucky. Weird. Okay. And, yeah. and hard to understand. But, I mean, you could make, you could drive it with some, you know, special code to do phonetics. And it could potentially talk. But it wouldn't, hmm. wouldn't sound very good. Because I was just thinking, I'm like, oh, well, in terms of sound, I mean, there's the Emic 2, which we've gone over, right? That's but what that's you use if you text. want to talk. Yeah, that's actual text. So, and then for in terms of, yeah, in terms of, oh, you know, you could have the Emic 2, like, singing and, or, like, doing its thing and the little sound pal doing accompaniment. Well, I did that mm -hmm. with Sidcog already. 
That's true. Yeah. You did that in software. I've already made that dream happen. <laughs> She's just talking tri- about a hardware a, a, solution instead of a software. It could be a, a, a trio. One. Oh, yeah, in hardware. You little... could do that, I guess. Yeah. I've got a new toy that I'm going to be working on a driver for um, here soon. Uh, Todic, uh, dot com sent me over a little uh, hardware sign generator board. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's not currently a driver for the prop because it's brand new. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put one together and uh, we'll have a little hardware music thingy that's not putting out square waves like most of them. It's putting out uh, sine waves. So now that is fun. This is a very good question because somebody in the forum asked how to make objects. How do you make an object? I know it's a you spin just, file, right? You just make it. It's I just mean, code. It's just it's object oriented programming. So it's just one object is another piece of code that gets sucked up into the the main program. I mean, there's there's some conventions for objects that are meant to be used by another program, which is that you usually name the code to get it up and running, something like start or init, and that's like the first function in the file after whatever it includes. Oh. And you know, your first pub. Yeah. And then and then when you include that object in another object, you call that function to get it set up or make it do something. But I mean it depends. Some some objects don't need any kind of start or setup. I've got so a, they just a little detail here that may help Addy. Um you you're used to writing programs that have more than one subroutine in them, right? Uh used to? I don't know, but you're I used have used to the idea I of I have, yes. You have more than one pub, yes. more than one yes. pry yes, yes, sort yes, of thing. Yes. Yes. Each mm-hmm. one of those could be in its own source code file. As long as you included those source code files in the top. So like say uh with No, the... there there would be a caveat there if they tried to access a global variable that was defined uh, in the main program, it wouldn't quite work right. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if you set them up, but if you had correctly, like local variables, then you could do it. Right. You're passing things around uh, through their functions, you know. Interesting. You could do all sorts of things. But yeah, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to do it this way, but that explains it to you in your brain so that you get it. Those become part of the main file. So oh. like as an example, a lot of your recent programs, you've had those uh, four or five I2C functions mm-hmm. that you've just been sort of copying into each one of them. Mm-hmm. You could have taken those five I2C functions, the read, write, start, stop, Mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. and made a single file that had those oh and just included it as an object from all the other programs and then just called it by you know object name dot read object name dot write oh. to access so, the functions so then i'm guessing that's what the i2c driver object does right Maybe? there's the the basic one yeah it has that ah, the, the more advanced one has assembly language in there to go really fast but sure yeah, and for that part, the general solution is to beg Roy for some PASM. <laughs> right, right. Although Which some, if I get stuck on the folks... sign thing, I'll be begging Roy for some PASM. Yeah. Yeah. Although some folks have been wanting us to go into PASM material. Which I, I actually don't mind because it sounds like I would like PASM it's very... quite a bit because it's like the nitty gritty. It's simple, you know, because the command set is only so big. There's only so many things to learn. Yeah. But then the ways in which that they can interact very quickly becomes emergently complex. Well, it's like learning the alphabet and you can put them well, together. It's easy to, to learn A three A through Z, but when you start thinking about all the words. all the sentences that you can make, it's infinite, right? Right. 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 Okay. And uh, you know, we might start off with something where you use PASM code from spin, which you've done a little bit of, but maybe use something simpler that then we could walk through the PASM to explain it to you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like turning an LED like. on and off. That was how well, I first turning started. an LED on and off in PASM is kind of silly. Oh. I was thinking something a little <laughs> bit more sophisticated. I see. All right. Like, you know, uh, my, maybe my TV. shift shift register driver that drives the LED color RGB LED. Oh, that's a good idea. That's right. Pretty, I used your code. Pretty, yeah, and it's pretty simple. I used your code. 
and not even understand it. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe it. All right. So we are on to continuing local Rogers uh, questions. And mm -hmm. I know last time From we... From the Parallax forums. Yes. Uh, local Roger got on there and he asked a whole list of uh, topics there that he said he'd like us to talk about. Right. And mm -hmm. we started that last week, and this week we're going to continue um, uh, going through some of these. There's there's a lot, so there's more than we could possibly cover today. Yep. So last week we finished on the real-time clock, like DS-1307, and mm -hmm. I vaguely remember it being an I2C yeah. thing. So in terms of like coding, like when you're at the top, you know, X and Freak, uh, you know, yeah, X and Freak or Clock Freak. Do you, do you just reference? Like, no, how do see, you... those, those the the real time clock is a separate chip with its own crystal and it's going at its own mm -hmm. update rate. Sure. The think clock of it frequency and X and Freak are just for the propeller processor performance. You know what settings you want it to run at. That's independent of each other. So for the real time you... clock, it's actually like time of day. So it's, you know, oh. one thirty four p.m. on, you know, and usually they have a date as well. So they can tell you the date and, you know, what day of the week it is and stuff like that. And they're typically set up with a battery so that when you turn off your project and turn it back on later, it still knows the date and time. So it's just a module. Right. It's yeah. just yeah. like it's an really altimeter like module, module or gyroscope or whatever. It's just a. Right. Oh, and they and and okay. you know you can make one out of the chip itself, and usually, more often they'll use a super cap mm -hmm. instead of a battery because mm -hmm. that'll hold it for many days without power. But batteries are also used in some cases. Um, but yeah, there's there's actually some modules. I think Adafruit has one, and maybe even SparkFun, mm -hmm. um, pre-made module that has the you know crystal and the battery backup and the and the chip all on it and you just hook it up to your you know, microcontroller with the data lines right and you know one time you'll like run a program that will set the time and date and all that into the real-time clock and then from that point on you just need to read it you read out the time and use it for whatever you want mm -hmm. you know, time time stamps on a file or if you're printing out something to a display you could display the time along with that gotcha okay mm -hmm. um spi ram for more da data storage now spi is another method of da data access just like i2c yeah, yeah it's just a serial okay. it's just a, a a simplified serial mechanism it doesn't uh work in a bus mechanism in exactly the same way as I2C because I2C, the two lines that you use can be shared across all the devices. Correct. Whereas with SPI, there's a couple of lines that can be shared, but then there's one line that can't be shared. I actually so have, have no have idea what SPI RAM is, so or SPI is, so... It's Serial Protocol Interface, I think is what it stands for. Okay. It's really simple. It's usually... Uh, uh, chip select and then a clock and data, you know, and sometimes sometimes it'll have both data in and data out on separate pins and sometimes it'll be on one pin. Mm. Um, the, it's, I think the correct form is all on one pin, but uh, it can be on, uh, they, have, they have alternate versions that are uh, what they call quad SPI, which is basically just four data lines at a time instead of one data line at a time. Okay. So it's not really serial anymore. Okay. It's parallel four bits at a time. So. Um, but it's it's just another way to communicate with the module that's similar to I2C, but it's just a different protocol. Okay. Is it easier and to use? It's It's equally the same. I mean, they're basically the same way. Right. I mean, it's, so you, from what you, it sounds like, besides the chip select, it's still a data and a clock line. So, right, and you still usually talk to them by sending a command byte and then a you know reading or writing afterwards. You know, it's it it de obviously depends on the device itself. Okay. Um, with SPI RAM, um, usually you'll have a command to say you want to read, and then you'll read a byte, or you can say read continuous and you'll read multiple bytes in a row and it'll automatically increment to the next address in the RAM chip. Um, 
and and SPI RAM is is handy for the propeller because it only takes a few pins to use it, and you can get you know 64, 128 meg S little RAM chips, and they're serial, so they don't take a whole lot of pins. Whereas normally, if you want to address the RAM non serially, you'll have like a data lines and address lines, and it takes a whole bunch of pins. You might use up like 18, 19, 20 pins just to talk to some RAM. Normally? Wow. Well, if it's yeah. parallel RAM. Think about the RAM in a computer. 240 pins for each chip. Uh, for each oh, those little chips, bar. I should say. Yeah. Those little bars. Yeah. But obviously, those are like 32-bit access or 64-bit access, and so they use a lot more pins. But with an 8-bit chip in parallel, depending on the size, you'll have you know some number of, of address pins you know, address data lines that you have to specify what address you're trying to access. And then uh, you'll have a read or write pin that you have to set. And then you'll have your data, you know, eight or 16 bits, depending on the size of RAM access. So it can add up to quite a few pins. So, so SPI RAM is much more compact because it's all, you know, you just only need a few pins and you can store a whole bunch of data on there. And so read it back. You buy these little chips where from wherever yeah, and DigiKey or you know, lots of places. There's a couple guys in the forums that make little modules for the propeller that use SPI RAM. Huh. And I think the C three board, which Parallax sells, also has some SPI RAM built into it. So then I mean I don't I don't even know if I've ever seen an SPI RAM chip, but it's got like However many connections, and then yeah, I think I think they're eight pin chips. Eight pins, eight pin chips, and then you collect connect four of them to the prop. I think and... it's only three, but it, it just oh. depends. Okay, I, I don't have the specific details of a specific chip. Sure, but yeah. Well, I'm just yeah, I'm just thinking sheet, generalities. You basically right. have your chip select and your clock and your data. Okay, and right. then in terms of accessing it, you'd need the exact address, much like how. Uh, yeah, you always like do like high EEPROM. EEPROM. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just like the EEPROM, it's just a slightly different command. So, so say you have like this massive program, right? Like, uh, normally I think we get what thirty two k, right? So, say you have a massive program, one twenty eight, whatever, and you're gonna do it into SPI RAM. Normally, we I just, you know, F11 or like burn to EEPROM, right? Right. So then what happens? So what you would need to do is have, uh, there's a couple different ways you could go about it. One is that you could put extra code into the upper part of the EEPROM. Okay. So you would have to do that in some kind of stage thing where you download a program into the prop that would then write your modules up into the upper part of the EEPROM and then write the main program into the lower part. And then when your main program runs, it would have to read stuff out of the EEPROM and write it out to the RAM chip. That's kind of a wow. not Ninja. really necessary mechanism because you already have it in the EEPROM. Another way to do it would be to have an SD card mm -hmm. plugged in and use one of the SD card objects to read data or code from the SD card into the SPI RAM chip to use. And let's uh, be clear here, usually uh, the application is that you're using the extra space, be it EEPROM, SD card, extra RAM, whatever, you're typically using it to store data that's being worked on and not using it to store more program. program itself. Oh, right. I see. Although uh, I believe the Prop GCC guys have some stuff set up where you can actually run code from external memory oh. that gets loaded up from like an SD card or something. I see. And they use they use the hub memory as a cache. I see. I've always wondered is 32k actually enough space in general for like a relatively complex program? No one will ever need more than 32k. <laughs> really? Okay, Mr. Gates. <laughs> um no, uh, <laughs> the one of the things that's really uh uh important or one of the things that makes the prop as powerful as it is is the fact that the spin language is really compact oh. 
Okay. And so you can do a lot of spin code in 32K. Yeah. Um, it's only when you need to do, you know, a lot of PASM where you start running out of memory because you only have limited amount of space in each cog for your PASM code. Mm-hmm. But uh, 32K, you can do quite a lot with that. There's some pretty... Uh, well, I imagine comp- if you can control a robot, like a roving robot, then yeah. Well, that's I mean, still look within at, 32K. I mean, the quadcopters that, that Parallax sells, all the software in there that's reading the accelerometers and the gyroscopes and doing all the correction and whatnot is all running in a single prop with 32K of EEPROM. Hmm. Let's, so. let's put it this way. They landed on the moon with less, so... <laughs> you know, yeah. stop setting the bar so low. Fair you enough. can do a lot with it. I can land on the moon with a propeller. You could. Awesome. I don't know oh. where you're going to get all the money for the 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 rocket fuel. The booster but... rocket, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'll make it. Yep. You'll make your own solid rocket booster. That, that sounds like correct. a really good way to get in trouble. <laughs> DIY. No. <laughs> They're not doing any videos on that. You could, you could win the X Prize. I could. I could. Not. All right. <laughs> and now I see now, the next question. To be clear here, yeah. Addie uh, had problems with code last night when she was working on a oh, project for five hours. That was awful. And it, her problem was that she wasn't giving a, a battery to her prop BOE board, and she was trying to drive a servo off the USB power oh. coming in on VIN. And uh, <laughs> it was just browning out and rebooting, yeah. browning out and rebooting. So do so we really do want people. this person in charge of designing anything that flies in space? I think not. Well, anything with massive amounts of rocket fuel involved. Why doesn't it just work the first time I do this? Why does it keep <laughs> crashing into the moon? I don't want it to crash, I want it to land. <laughs> Well, it's it's that. It's Did you that, hook up the battery, Eddie? No. It's that funny inverse thing where, you know, the more you work on it, the the more you expect it to work the right the first time, and the less you work on it, the more surprised you are when it works. The well, there's first also time. there's also just sense? the more you work on it, the more you forget the little details, and you just true. expect them to work. I guess that's true. When she you first had problems, she asked in the IRC, you know, right. for suggestions. And the first suggestion was, uh, did you plug it in? And she said, yes. The answer should have said, you know, mentally she should have said, um, yes, I plugged it in, but I plugged it into a very limited current source. No, yeah. you, you know what it is? It's because on the prop BOE, like I usually have the, a 7.5 wall wart or whatever connected yeah. to the the prop as well as to USB. So right. I I take it for granted that I have that extra power to you know to use. Can't and so, take anything for granted with embedded design. Well, that's fine. Yeah, I mean now I know if it put 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 puts you know then it's <laughs> acting like a fool. But yeah. you know, which by the way I think we should have a episode where we go through some troubleshooting. Uh, things for each of the modules. Okay. I think that'd be useful. We but... kind of discussed a couple of those, like when you had the wrong module plugged in and stuff. Uh, like that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd say that's worse than not hooking up a battery. The yeah, hooking up the wrong module and make sure you have the right module. <laughs> like if your IQC device is always returning zero, you might want to make sure you actually have the right IQC uh, device plugged in. Annoying. <laughs> So if Addie were... Well, it wasn't returning zero. It was returning like the right thing. No, but well, like, no, it, it was returning zeros at the low level and mathematically turning into a big negative number. Oh, I see. I see. When writing directions for Addie on how to make a sandwich, you have to <laughs> include things like use the microwave and not the dishwasher to cook the food. <laughs> I don't use dishwashers to cook food. Why would you do that? in the directions that you were that you were given early on, uh-huh. you probably did try to make food in the dishwasher once because you make every single mistake that's possible. Once. Once. Almost, except for programming. Programming, you, you the, just... You could use the dry cycle, I guess. It's <laughs> <laughs> a terrible idea. <laughs> First spin, right? Well, right? yeah. Put some water in there, it'll be steamed food. <laughs> In the event of a zombie apocalypse. 
Wrong show, guys. Wrong show. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, number five, SD cards for major data storage. Probably more than one episode. One for SBI access to read and write sectors. Then the yeah, partition so the, system. there's two ways to use an SD card, and the most common way that most people want to use it is using uh you know one of the fsrw or kai dos drivers because they do the full file system so you could take your sd card and plug it into your windows or mac pc and copy a file onto it and then take it out and plug it into the propeller and then read the file how do you just plug um, it into the propeller well with the sd card slot like on the prop boe really right? it has one it has, a, it has an sd card slot it's Gosh. in there underneath the it's like a treasure trove of awesome I haven't even seen. I don't even know where. Okay, so it's, it's, there's it's a lot of stuff on there that you haven't the uh, used that you leave in there all the time. Well, I I only discovered the servo headers about. Isn't two there like ago. ADC so. on there too? Yes, there is. Is really? there a DAC on there as well? No, I don't think there's a DAC. All right, okay, so Mine, so SD card by SD card, do you mean? Like my camera's SD card. Uh -huh. Yeah, standard SD, yeah. secure digital data card. Right. Wow. That's what that SD That's like stands 16 for. gigs right there. Yeah. What am I yeah. gonna do with 16 gigs on the propeller? Take uh, the have world. lots and lots and lots of data. Well, no, we need to use our SD cards that we have for video production, so you you can do exactly nothing with it. On I know, prop. I know. But you could get you could get like a small one gig or two gig one, which are it's super kind of hard cheap to find now. Even small. Yeah. <laughs> so people usually load spin files on their little SD cards. Well, they they can they can put whatever they want on the SD card. Like I used it with uh, when I was doing the spinneret stuff. I put all my web files, you know, the image files and the oh. HTTP files onto onto the SD card, and then use the propeller to feed those through the internet, right? But. Uh, that's that's the more complicated way where you really need to use one of those drivers, one of those objects that already exist because they're very complicated and full of PASM and mm -hmm. they deal with the whole fat file system and and whatnot. And that's way beyond the scope of this show to discuss that. It would take like 10 shows probably just to discuss doing that full system. The other sure. one, though, the simple uh, SPI access to the low level where you're just accessing one sector at a time. Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. And some people use that and they just don't care about the file system and they just use the SPI. They just store data on the, on the SD card then in their own format, linearly writing data out one sector at a time. And it's, um, how do you know what the sectors are? It's just like RAM. It's very similar to RAM. Just you're addresses. just writing out addresses and they just come in blocks of usually 512 or or 2K, 512 bytes or 2K or something like that. And you find these addresses by looking at their data sheets or what? Well, the, the SD cards all have a, you know, a fixed setup that they start at some address and go up forever right? oh. until they run out of memory. Oh. Um, so you're just accessing sector zero through, you know, however many is on the SD card. When you have 16 gigs, there's hundreds of thousands of them. So... <laughs> Huh. Okay. You know. Well, that's all the uh, the time we have to answer questions. We've only got like a minute left. We should mention that the next few weeks you know, we will be uh, taking a couple week break here from the show, but we'll be back. Yes, we will be back. Um, <laughs> so don't fret. Send yeah, emails, Brian. It'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's and just a break. We'll see. I mean, we'll see if we can record some more uh, later this week. But, Put your head uh, down. Take deep breaths. <laughs> Tuck it between your knees. You'll be all right. <laughs> Here's a paper bag. <laughs> you know, that actually works. <laughs> Does it? Yeah, because when people hyperventilate. Eddie's a nurse. Yeah. She knows these things. When people hyperventilate, they get too much oxygen. So uh, and there's another get, thing uh, that I wanted to bring up, too, real doesn't. quick before we... <laughs> Real quick, before we finish up here, um, Eddie and I started off a new show yes. this week on our YouTube channel. Uh, we're in the process of setting up a hacker space here in Rochester, Minnesota. That's true. And uh, we'll be doing a lot of construction videos and building desks and benches and workbenches and tool closets and building our own couch from scratch and all sorts of interesting stuff. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, once we uh, get done with that, we'll be featuring a lot of member projects and all sorts of cool hackery, makery, whatever you want to call it. And uh, if you want to check that out, you can go to our website, tymkrs.com, and just follow the YouTube link on the side of the page, and that'll bring us uh, you to our channel. Yep. Anything else, guys? Uh, that's it for me. All right, that's it for us for this week. You can find this show every Tuesday evening at first spin.tv. There's an RSS link on the page, so you can set up automatic downloads via iTunes, your your phone, um, if your phone company didn't disable it remotely for you being a clever hacker who jailbroke it. And uh, uh, let's see, that's awkward. it. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.